Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining me for the third episode of BCG Alumni Leaders. Today, I'm most honored in celebration of International Women's Day month as well to be joined by Sandy Moose, a great friend, colleague, and mentor. Sandy hails from the class of 1968. She was the first consultant, female consultant, that Bruce Henderson hired. And uh, she has had many, many leadership roles while her uh, time at BCG, including being the head of our office in New York, where I first met her, the head of the East Coast, and also member of the executive committee. She then graduated from BCG, is serving on a number of public and private boards, but we've just recently re-invited her to join us in our senior advisor cadre to help many clients and also us on a day-to-day -day basis. So welcome back, Sandy. Today, we'll be chatting about Sandy's career, her words of wisdom, advice, and also her thoughts about the choose to challenge theme of International Women's Day. So with that, Sandy, maybe we can get started. Perhaps you can just tell us a little bit about how your career began at BCG. All right, would you like me to start with how I joined BCG? I know it's an old story, but, uh, and it dates me even more than the 1968 seems to date me. Uh, in any case, when I was uh, finishing up at college and deciding what I wanted to do, I had thought I'd like to have a career in business because my father was a businessman. So I applied at Harvard Business School to find out that they weren't yet accepting women in the two-year degree program. You could go to Radcliffe, you could go for one year and get an associate MBA degree from Radcliffe College. If you did well, you could reapply and then they might accept you. And if they accepted you, you could go for your second year, at which point you would get a full-fledged MBA degree from Harvard. And I thought that was a very chancy proposition to have to go through two admissions processes. And if I didn't make it, I would end up with an associate MBA degree from Radcliffe College of all places. And I thought that wasn't too valuable. So I decided to apply to the other side of the river at Harvard and um, miracles never ceased to amaze me. I got accepted in the doctoral program in economics at, on the other side of the river at Harvard. And fast forward, I got my PhD in 1968. And as I was finishing my doctoral dissertation, I finished up actually in January of 1968. Uh, it wasn't a good time to get an academic position. And by that point in my career, I had thought I wanted to teach. So I had to find something else to do. Fortunately, I was in a wedding party and one of the people in the wedding party was teaching at Harvard Business School. So I said, what do I do about a job? I was totally clueless. And of course, Harvard didn't give career counseling to anyone in the PhD program because they figured you were going to go on to academia. They never thought you would ever get a non-academic job. And so he suggested, why don't I try consulting? And he was good friends with Bruce Henderson. And he said, you know, the Boston Consulting Group's a small firm. And he said, it's a little academic. And he said, you might just fit in. So he said, I'll call Bruce and give you an introduction, which I thought was lovely. I knew nothing about writing a resume. So I call and I expected to speak to Bruce's assistant. And instead, I go directly through to Bruce, which I didn't really want to talk to Bruce. I wanted to talk to his assistant. So I'm telling Bruce everything I know about myself in about two minutes. And I'm sure he felt as though he was sitting at the receiving end of a fire hose, at which point he said, well, come on in. So I go in and I have an interview. So unlike the recruiting processes of today, I had one interview. It was with the founder. And inside of five minutes, Bruce and I are in a raging argument. He is talking about experience curves and how costs go down forever. And he's putting his graphs on the blackboard. I go and erase them. And with my newly minted PhD and feeling so proud of myself, I said, well, Bruce, costs don't go down forever. They ultimately turn up because it's something called a long run average cost curve. So I put my graphs on, he erases them. We're going back and forth with what seemed to be an hour. I don't know how long it was. At which point, Bruce starts pulling his hair out. And he was a tall Southern gentleman, largely bald, but with a fringe of white hair. And as he's talking to me, he's pulling his hair out. And as he's pulling his hair out, he looks at me and says, lady, if you want a job, you got one. But he said, I've never heard of a woman in management consulting. And then he said, you know, we got 16 guys here. And when you come right down to it, they don't really know a lot about consulting. He said, you could call them flakes. 
And he said, I guess it doesn't matter if we add one more flake to that mix. So on that auspicious note, I joined BCG as another flake with the full expectation I would probably spend two years and then get my anecdotes, understand more about business and go back into teaching. So 35, 36 years later, <laughs> as Mickey said, I transitioned from BCG to a second career as, um, uh, as a director of, of corporate boards, as well as some nonprofits. What compelled me is after that interview, why heaven's name would I accept the offer? Uh, I was so compelled um, by Bruce and his sense of mission that BCG could change the world. And he was fond of citing Archimedes and saying, give me a place to stand and a lever long enough and we can change the world. And to him, the place to stand was BCG with bright young people and the lever long enough with the ideas. I just thought that was such a compelling mission that we could change the world through ideas and have impact on our clients and on business school education. And it was very empowering as a young person, I was young then in my early 20s to be told, you know, you can change the world. The highlight of my career, Mickey mentioned, was um, as managing partner of BCG's New York office. And we can talk about that later. But essentially, uh, I went down to the New York office not too long after its founding. And it was a struggling office. We had 15, 16, 17 consultants, no great book of business. We had a couple of junior partners, no managers. And it was really not the most attractive space in the world. So I was told I had two years to either turn it around or to close it. So it was exciting. Obviously, I didn't close it. And uh, <laughs> we know what the history is. And in the course of doing that, that's how I met Mickey and Rich. In fact, they were in the same cohort group. And I think they interviewed me as opposed to me interviewing them. But I was delighted both of them accepted the offer and both became wonderful friends and have enjoyed mentoring them over the years. I love your story about how Bruce interviewed you, but it's the very first time I heard that you had gotten the interview at a wedding reception. So that was a first, despite the many years I've known you. And you mentioned Rich, of course, who is uh, Rich Lesser, our CEO. And yes, indeed, the two of us did interview you because we weren't quite sure who you were, the senior person, you know, coming down from Boston and ready to shut us down. But maybe that relates to the next question I have for you in your many years. Um, you know, changing the world, as Bruce said, is a hard thing to do. Leadership is hard. I wonder if there are particular moments you remember in terms of the particularly difficult challenges and how you overcame them. Yeah, I think the initial one was being the only woman. And believe it or not, you're going to find this funny, but uh, initially, what did I wear? Uh, <laughs> it wasn't obvious what I would wear. Uh, because I thought I should wear a suit. But in those days, the suits that they had for women were designed for soccer moms. So they had big, <laughs> plaid, heavy jackets that were so heavy, you had to take them off inside because they were too warm. And then you'd be in a skirt and a blouse. And that was the standard uniform for an assistant. So I said, well, I can't do that. And pantsuits were just starting to come in. And the negative reaction of men to pantsuits, they were very severely tailored and you wore floppy ties that went with them and they were they were rather ugly so I decided pantsuits weren't the way to go so I ended up wearing dresses and that seemed to work uh, and uh, but then the more serious challenge was how do you speak up as a woman how do you get air time and how do you overcome your own sense of feeling as though you're a goldfish in a goldfish bowl and any fault step uh, could be a disaster. So um, that took a bit of, of uh, getting used to doing that. But I'd have to say my name actually helped because BCG was always very good in introducing me as Dr. Sandy Moose. And as you've got to see our guy, guy was sort of standard, generic, male, female, you've got to see our guy, Sandy Moose. So I would walk in and everybody expected that it was a man where Sandy was the nickname for Alexander. And no one expected a woman to have the last name of Moose. So as a result, you know, I got into places that I might not have gotten into had I had a different name. And once I was there, uh, I managed to uh, get some airtime. And as long as I didn't do anything blatantly stupid, I was OK. So that was kind of a, a fun initial challenge. Now, switching gears, I mean, during that period of time, you were certainly a mentor to me and so many others from BCG. 
But I'm wondering, uh, who helped you? You mentioned John Isaacs earlier as you try to reset the course for uh, the New York office and beyond. But I wonder if you can talk a little bit about mentorship and who helped you. Okay, good. You know, John was more of a peer, but a wonderful uh, mentor as a peer. Uh, when I first joined BCG, Bruce assigned two partners to work with me. Uh, because he realized that I had pretty academic training in economics and I didn't know a lot about business. So uh, I think once a week we met and they taught me, uh, taught me accounting principles and all kinds of business jargon that I didn't know anything about. And so it was a real class for about an hour and a half at the end of a work day. And then I worked with uh, both of them in terms of case assignments. And what really helped me enormously is I could do the analytical work, but I just wasn't sure how you put it together in a storyline and presented it to, um, to our clients. So it was very helpful to actually sit down next to them as they took my analysis and said, this is how we're gonna put it onto slides in the storyline. So I learned a lot by having someone actually walk through and talk me through what they were doing, why they were doing it, so I could go off and do it myself. So uh, I felt as though that was really probably more actual training uh, than mentoring. Uh, I remember Stephanie Paponis talking about the difference between being trained and mentored, where trained is like a plant or going to the gym. So in many respects, I was like a plant being trained and twisted and whatever. Uh, to do the right things. And it, it was really a very helpful process. Uh, and then uh, there weren't any other women. So you're probably going to find this odd. But I actually found Barbara Walters was very helpful as a role model to me. She was about a dozen years older. She was the first woman to co-anchor the nightly news. It was a big deal. So I observed what, how she dressed, her style, and her interviews, I know she does a lot of fluffy interviews today, but in those days, she was a hard hitting reporter and she would talk with the heads of state and she was excellent and she was always prepared. You might even argue over prepared. And she didn't mind that she had sheets of paper in front of her that she would consult in terms of asking her questions. So I found that um, that was a very helpful role model for me, in addition to my two assigned role models from BCG. And today, frankly, I look at younger partners and ask for feedback from younger partners in order to make sure I, I stay relevant. So I, I think it's great to be able to reach out to people either as role models or mentors and learn from what from their successes and also, too, from some of their mistakes so that you don't, you don't repeat some of those. Uh, maybe we can now move ourselves to today and the future, Sandy. I know that we've been chatting the other day. I don't think anybody expected the year or so that we've had with the world going through what it is with the pandemic. And as we think about leadership going forward and the unique challenges all of us face, what are your thoughts about leaders and what they need to do to survive and thrive in the new reality we live in? Oh, I don't know. I think you're probably closer to some of these things than I am. But, you know, I think whenever there's a lot of change going on, you should stay close to your customers and your clients to understand what's happening to them, what their needs are, and where their latent dissatisfactions might be and how you can help them. And I think it's very important to stay close to your staff. I kind of viewed our staff as clients, not as employees, but as clients and making sure that I understood uh, what their issues were. And I think this working remotely has, it, it's difficult um, no matter where you are in your career stage or life stage, it, it poses challenges. And I think it's important to be sensitive to the staff and to, to help them and probably spend more time and more thought in terms of dealing with some of their issues than you might not, you might not have done under more normal times. I think networking with peers helps because I think everybody is trying to figure out what the future of work is going to be and how a hybrid model of remote and in-person is really going to work. So networking with them to finding out what they're doing, because this is all evolving real time. No one has the, the playbook of success yet. So just picking up some tidbits. And I think doing some scenario planning at this point is always useful. And that's, in fact, what I'm doing now and helping a couple of my nonprofits 
as you're starting to come out of the pandemic, uh, worst case, best case, uh, you know, mid case, and then what could be some other uh, wild cards thrown in there. And I think you have to be willing to do some experiments and then to pivot off of those experiments as, as they pay off. So I think flexibility, but being really close to your customers and to your staff is very important. Listen well, because uh, I think that's where you're going to learn what the issues are and pick up some new ideas and new thoughts. Indeed, I think figuring out ways to stay together, although we are far apart, I think is indeed key. So yeah. thank you. One final question, uh, given this year's theme for International Women's Day being choose to challenge. How do you choose to challenge? What are your thoughts there? My challenging. Well, at the moment, I'm in, involved with a couple of charitable boards. One is the Museum of Fine Arts and the other is the Huntington Theater. And I'm chairman of the Nominating and Governance Committee on the Huntington Theater. Mm -hmm. And the theater industry in particular has been under attack for its lack of diversity. And the Huntington Theater, interestingly, produces plays and has an educational program that's very much on the leading edge of dealing with these social justice issues and racial equality. But interestingly, the senior and mid-level staffs and the boards of advisors and boards of trustees do not reflect the diversity or representation that's actually in our product, which is kind of interesting. Most people are struggling and not having a product that deals with these issues. We actually are very successful there in employing lots of BIPOC playwrights, directors, actors, and dealing with the leading edge issues. But it's not reflected in our senior staff and on our board. So my challenge this year is to see what I can do um, to change uh, the profile of who we have both on the staff as well as on the boards in having more diversity and more representation, frankly, not just uh, so we're focused on BIPOC, but also just more broadly representation in different parts of the community and different industry segments. So I realize that having done some of that in our New York office, as you remember, it's on, it's not a quick fix. This is a long journey. And we'll be lucky to have some initial successes, but we're looking at five, seven years before you're going to really say, aha, we've made a meaningful change. But hoping to have some quick wins, too. Well, Sandy, I've always known you to over deliver on your commitments and expectations. <laughs> so let's see how slow you'll go to go fast. And I suspect you'll get there way sooner than what you might have just said. But thank you for sharing your thoughts. Thank you for this conversation. I've known you for years, and there are many stories I've heard for the very first time. Oh, dear. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you so much for joining oh. me uh, for this episode. And I hope the rest of you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. Please look forward to next month's installation of BCG Alumni Leaders with great thanks to my dear friend, Sandy Moose. Dr. Thank Moose. you, Mickey. I enjoyed it too. Thank you. Bye -bye. All my best for the International Women's Day.